Hello and welcome to the Drexel interview. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohen, speaking to you from the university's picture gallery. Today our guest is the acclaimed poet Gerald Stern. Gerald Stern is the recipient of just about every major American poetry award there is. The National Book Award, the Wallace Stevens Award, the Guggenheim, and several, several National Endowment of the Arts Awards, among many others. He's a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets, and until his retirement, taught at the Iowa Writers Workshop. He now lives and continues to write in Lambertsville, New Jersey. Gerald Stern, welcome to the Drexel interview. Thank you, Paula. I noticed you said Lambertsville. Everybody says Lambertsville. It's Lambertville. Forgive me for correcting oh. you so soon in the show. <laughs> you owe me one, but okay. I'm but very sensitive to that. Well, you're sensitive to words. So yeah, well, but you know, that's a New York thing. Everybody in New York, you're not from New York. Well, right? yes, I am. But yes. everybody in New York says Lambertsville. It's an English term. Lambert, like Lambert's name. Yeah, yeah. Well, so why do the New Yorkers say Lambert? I don't know, because they're Meshuggah. <laughs> oh, okay. So we'll just put it down to Meshuggah. <laughs> I want to start by um, congratulating you. Thank you very on much. On your most recent book, Save the Last Dance, from Norton. Um, beautiful book. Is uh, that a beautiful book? It's a beautiful edition. Um, and, Painting uh, by Chaim Soutine, the Belarus poet, a painter. Well, I wonder if you would start this interview by reading um, a poem from this collection. And I had given you some suggestions from my own. Uh, well, what, what, what do well, you, what would you I, like to I, read? I, I thought the poem Spaghetti okay. captured a lot of elements that I think are characteristic of this volume. I'd be very happy to and read it. And I wonder it. if you would And read. it's open to that? Terrific. Yes. Spaghetti. Not infrequently just. Not infrequently destroyed as bits of paper of no value by the women in my family, namely Ida, Libby, and the maid Selma. My drawings were gone by the time I was 11, and so I turned to music and led orchestras walking through the woods. And Saturday nights, we feasted on macaroni, tomato soup, and falso cheese cooked at 350 degrees, which I called spaghetti until I was 21, and loved our nights there. Thelma, Libby, and Ida, fat as I was then, fat and nearsighted, and given over to art such as I saw it, though smothered somewhat by the three of them. And it would be five years of breaking loose, reading Kropotkin first, then reading Keats, and standing on my head and singing, by which I developed the longing, though I never turned against that spaghetti. I was always loyal to one thing. You could, always, you could almost measure my stubbornness and my wildness by that loyalty. Oh, that's a great poem. Yeah, it's funny when you read, I read it self-consciously because you asked me to, and these, this, of course, I hate it when artists say this actually happened, but this, this is true. My mother, every Saturday night, because my father was away, working late, would make this hideous dish, which she called spaghetti, which I thought was spaghetti till I encountered real spaghetti. And she would take um, um, Mueller's macaroni and uh, some kind of tomato soup, and Velveeta cheese, and mix them together, and bake them. It was hideous. I loved it. But somehow you've evoked that world of women within which you were so coddled and secure. And how old were you? What, what age were you? As eight. You? Eight. Seven. My grandmother, Libby, who had a Russian Jewish accent. My mother, first generation, born in Bialystok, Poland and an African-American maid, because it was the 30s and people had maids then, mm -hmm. even if they were middle and lower middle class. There were still hangovers from the earlier ages, you know, when everybody had maids. And, we, and Thelma stayed with us for almost 10 years. She, she was a member, we were all members of the same family. There's, there's a quality of tremendous nostalgia to that poem, and to in many of the poems in that volume, and I wonder, 
Um, are you aware of that? Is that a pull on you? Do you think back at that time with, with a tremendous sense I, of nostalgia? I don't consciously do that. Mm. But I, I'm aware of it, to certainly, when I'm into the poem, and certainly when I've done the poem, and view it critically, sometimes negatively, and throw it away, yeah. and say it's too emotional, too sensitive, too, too sentimental, or what have you, or it works. Uh, but that was a typical Saturday night. And it, it, was, it was a female household. Yeah, but you describe yourself as overweight. I was fat. <laughs> And I, I, I was drawing and painting them. Uh -huh. One day, all my drawings disappeared. I guess they were cleaning house, and they destroyed my life oh, as an artist. Oh, how sad. So I had to become a poet uh -huh. by default. So there was, that was the road not taken. Yeah. Hmm. I, I still draw and fool around a little bit. When did you decide to become a poet? When did you become fascinated with words? I guess I've always been fascinated by words, but... I, I was writing poetry as a teenager and throwing it away. I remember writing a poem when I was 14 on, uh, on Mother's Day, a poem for my mother, an attack on the commercial, on Mother's Day as a commodity, and so on and so on, which I discovered. You already all, had a political consciousness. I discovered then, yeah. that all alone, and yeah. I remember giving the poem, writing it out very carefully on a broken down old secretary desk, and. Given it, giving it to my mother, and she broke into tears, not because of the poem, because I hadn't given her a gift, you know, a pair of stockings or a handkerchief or something like that. And I suddenly, I suddenly felt horribly betrayed that she didn't understand. She didn't understand the gift of the poem. No. And how much more special it was. I spent a whole morning on it. But I was always into words. And uh, I don't know what, one never knows what moves you to do that to be obsessive about that, the way writers are, you know. Uh, I attribute a lot of it to the death of a sister. And, and she died when I was eight, and she was nine, and we were the only siblings in that family. So this must have been after her death, when my grandmother lived with us. She and I remember Thelma and I, Thelma and Libby used to argue over kosher. What was kosher, which pot was milk and which was fleischig, which was meat driven and which was dairy driven. Endlessly, I remember so, those arguments. So I take it then you grew up in a Jewish household. Was this yeah, it was an Orthodox an household. Orthodox, is this a major influence on your sensibility, on your writing? Well, I turned against it at 13 years in one day. After your bar mitzvah then? Yeah. And why did you turn against it? Part of the separation you described in that The separation I, I saw it as ridiculous unnecessary, I didn't like the people involved, and they, I, I wanted to be free. I, I didn't like being tied down to a, an institution constantly. And it was around this period that you began writing poetry, I yeah. suppose. Could you read another poem in sure. this volume? I've also marked it. Very short. Very different, I think. Perhaps not. Um, but I found it so lovely. And Thank that's you. the word that comes to me. Blue like that. Oh, blue like that. She was a darling with her roses, though what I like is lavender, for I can dry it and nothing is blue like that. So here I am in my arms, a bouquet of tragic lavender, the whole history of Southern France against my chest, the fields stretching out, the armies killing each other, horses falling, Frenchmen dying by the thousands, though none for love. Of course, I'm talking about the wars and the religious wars in the, the French Crusade, I forgot what that crusade was called, where the northern French destroyed the southern French because they talked about God with, in the wrong way, uh, as they saw it. <laughs> and southern France has these beautiful fields of lavender. And I've traveled through that in Provence, in the Midi, but none of, none of those, those people who died, died for love. None of them died. They died for hate. And lavender has always been this, this magic and terrific color for me. I've always, I, my heart breaks when I think, when I, I can still remember clothes I wear when I was three years old and four years old, kind of little lavender suits. Hmm. And you call it tragic lavender. Yeah, I think that's why I call it tragic lavender. Because of the past and the 
and the fact and the that it's gone? And the past for, for those wonderful southern French who were destroyed by the northern French. Well, I forgot what they were called. I forgot what that crusade was. Actually, one of the crusades. One crusade, they killed children. One, they killed Jews. One, they killed Arabs. You know, good Christian stuff. So still topical today. Still very topical yeah. today. This volume is divided into three parts. And I wonder if you talk about Like Gaul. Caesar said Gaul was div divided into, into three, three parts. parts. Uh, so what are these three parts? The last part, it's clear, is a long poem. And it's somehow derived from Ecclesiastes. It does indeed. A very interesting It's an poem. ironic take on... It, it, it's an ironic take on Ecclesiastes. The, the, the subject of the poem is the hole in the universe, whatever that means. I don't mean the black hole, God knows. Whatever hole there Whatever, is. the hole could be a lack, or it could be a lacuna, an interruption. I, rem I, w I was sitting in Princeton, the city I lived near, with a husband of a good friend of mine, who was a physicist, an astrophysicist, um, Jerry Ostreicher, mm -hmm, uh, Alicia Ostreicher. They were sitting in a coffee house. He said, you know more, and I, and I wanted to talk to him about the hole in the universe, because he's a physicist. He says, you know a lot more about the hole in the universe than I do. He said, but please put me in the poem. So I put him in the poem. OK, because you deal in metaphor. I mean, yeah, that's your yeah, yeah. living. And he's a great um, respecter and a great supporter. Uh -huh of his wife's, po his wife's poetry, which is Yeah, and she's a wonderful terrific. poet. Um, I wonder, this poem, this collection is your latest, and it is, as I said, the 16th, maybe it's the 17th, maybe it's the 15th volume, but obviously you've been writing for a very long time. Right. And I wonder if you would tell us a little bit about the changes that your poetic sensibility has gone through. Would you say it's been an evolution, or would you say that's too progressive a term to use? Sometimes it's an evolution, sometimes it's a... A uh, revolution. At, 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 at one point, uh, I, I've written an essay about this. It's called Some Secrets. And it was published in a book uh, of essays by seven poets and seven uh, prose writers. Uh, at, at one point, there was a sudden and radical departure from what I'd been doing earlier, a sudden awakening, if you will, into a new kind of poetry. And this happened in the very late 60s. And since then, I've been on a roll, a continuum. I've been writing the same kind of poem, but there has been, there have been, you know, been an evolution since then. What was that revolution? What did that, that the, 60s it, revolution? It, 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 it involved the, the Quarante, the crisis of 40, the real, realization that I wouldn't be a young graduate student forever, <laughs> rolling my baby around in a baby carriage with a big thick book there that I didn't have all the time in the world, that I, that I was too playful, too coy, too pretty, too, too ironic, that I had to do some serious, I didn't have a lot of time left, that I had to address myself to serious business. So it's heavier, more tragic? And, and I had a serious bout of depression, which lasted a couple of months. And I discovered that on some other work I was doing, I was writing little notes almost unconsciously. And those notes were finished poems. And I suddenly realized those were poems. And I published those in a little book that pre that was the first of this new series, if you will. It was a book called Rejoicings, which is the name of the tractate of mourning in the Talmud. It's called Rejoicings. So that was the turning point. For that you. was the turning point. And, and I was, it like was the 41 or 42 years old. Okay, that's right. And since then, there, there have been changes, but in a way, it changes more than other people might notice than me. I don't, and, and if there is, if I can generalize, the change is more, more and more towards music, and I don't, almost don't care. From time to time, I do, seriously. But I don't, almost don't care about the other things. It, it, it's music I'm writing. More and more, it's music. Well, certainly in blue like that, I feel that music. Yeah, yeah, sense. yeah. 